Now, good evening. I am Amadino Bayoy. Welcome to Top Talk. Investigative journalism the world over is highly respected for the pains and meticulousness required to uncover truths which are often intentionally withheld and under the watch of various gatekeepers with personal interests. Without the work of journalists in the field, the public can be in the dark about matters of grave importance. In recent times, however, social media has led to a rapid virality and sharing of uncovered information which may or may not have a domino effect on the state of the nation. My guest today is an award-winning investigative journalist. He's worked with and written across many local and international media organizations. His works has appeared on CNN, The New Yorker, The African Report, Business Day, and Netflix. I'm joined today by David Hundain to speak about the many polarizing stories is broken and what challenges there are to digging for information in Nigeria. All right, good evening, David Ondain. Welcome to Top Talk. All right, uh, let's start uh, with this uh, straight away. Why investigative journalism? Surely there are less stressful and uh, peaceful jobs to have, uh, but yet you choose one that uh, causes a, a whole lot of stress. Why? Uh, what do you hope to achieve with this path you've taken? Well, um, I should specify that I didn't um, necessarily intentionally set out from the start to become an investigative journalist per se. It just sort of happened. So, um, I started off in marketing and then I got an opportunity in television and I moved into television. And um, from there, the doors opened and I sort of, because I, I, I was a reporter called uh, the other news for the cable cast. And from there, other writing opportunities opened. Now, I trained in school as a journalist, but up until that point, I hadn't actually practiced per se, apart from mm -hmm. a few, my NYC at state television and a few months at the newspaper. So, but I got the opportunity in the international space and I was sort of growing a reputation outside Nigeria. I was writing on the international platform, even though nobody in Nigeria knew who I was. Yeah. Uh, it was in 2019 that uh, things started to change, specifically after the election in 2019, when I thought yeah. that, okay, I have a voice outside people I am in the US and elsewhere, but nobody in Nigeria knows who I am. And this is actually where this voice is needed. So I started trying to uh, focus more on doing work for Nigerian platforms. It didn't start off as investigative work. Mm -hmm. I was basically doing, I was doing commentary, I was doing columns, I was doing analysis. Nineteen, um, my my good friend and the editor of uh, Newswire, that's uh, Mercy Aban, reached mm -hmm. out to me and uh, she said she had a story that she thought, she thought, you know what, she, she, could possibly, she could possibly have done it herself, but she thought that the way I wrote was engaging. She thought that I would be uh, I'll, 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 I'll be good choice to tell the story. So she didn't even think I could investigate it. She, she sort of just brought the story to me. So mm. sort of for me to, to be the storyteller. And I took what she gave me and then I ran with it. And I realized that what I was doing was actually investigative work because I was mm. trying to gather more information. I was trying to flesh out what I already had access to. I was trying to speak to sources. So it just kind of happened that actually, I, by the time that story came out, the story was a story about um, the uh, Abuja raids. Yeah. That um, that period when young women in Abuja would be yeah. harassed, raped, and kidnapped by the by thugs and police working for the Abuja Environmental Protection Bureau under the leadership of Haji Safiya Umar. Now I was the one who, who broke that story. That eventually led to um, the High Court decision mm. by. Uh, a, a justice, uh, Butala Binta Iyako, which outlawed such things. And my story was actually cited in, in the judgment. Now, when that happened, in the space of three, two, three months, between August and November, that was when a sort of light bulb went off above my head that actually the sort of changes that I've been looking to, to spark, the sort of things I've been hoping to achieve by writing analysis and columns and whatnot, that haven't been happening. I did one investigative story and look, what has happened, it mm. caused a change because mm. ultimately the purpose of journalism, I think, is to sort of 
they create some kind of positive change in the world. It's not just your voice to be heard. Mm. Like you're not you're not speaking out because you like the sound of your voice, yeah. because you're trying to achieve something. So when that happened, I thought, okay, this is an opportunity now. So I might have fallen into this by accident, but it turns out that I'm actually pretty really good at this. So mm. let's keep doing it. Mm. I actually signed a, a contract with, with Newswire. I was I did work with them for just about a year between uh, December 2019 and uh, uh, November 2020. Mm. So during that period is when I sort of grew that reputation for the first time as an investigative journalist, primarily on Newswire. And during that time, it never I, I never really sat down to think that oh um, this is difficult or do I still want to keep doing this because I think it was just really there was a certain euphoria if you like about mm. being able to to achieve something being able to 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 be part of some kind of change because one thing that I've, I've, I've always hated doing is just constantly being on the sidelines complaining about how other people are doing their work and your journalism is shallow it's not this it's not that and then i myself i'm just sort of sitting on the sideline complaining about other people and i'm mm. not doing something about it. So mm. for the first time, I was actually able to be in the arena and to do something about it. So yeah. if there was a story that was in the public domain, and I felt as if this story wasn't being uh, sufficiently, it wasn't being told the correct way, it wasn't being handled the correct way, instead of just complaining about it on Twitter or something, mm. for the first time, I realized I could actually just go, I could dive into it, investigate it myself, yeah. tell the story myself, use my own sources. And I had a, you know, you know, unfortunately, I had the backing of a few big platforms, particularly Newswire, that helped me to put these stories out to a to wider audience. So that was actually sort of like the, the light bulb thing for mm. me. Between 2019 and 2020, it was like, finally, I, I feel like the, the career that I'm doing, the work that I'm doing has a purpose. It's not just, I'm, I'm not just working to make money. I'm not just working to move from one month to the next, which was which was what I was doing for, the, for a long time, actually. Mm. Uh, so, for example, prior to when I, I became a journalist, per se, uh, when I was I, I was running a creative writing agency, a, a content creation agency, and mm. I had, it was a pretty successful agency, you know, for the size it was, a really small agency, but I was doing some, some I had a good number of international clients, but I just realized that it was the same thing every month. Um, writing invoices, clients pay money mm. after I've done the work. I don't really like the work that I'm doing because I find it's just basically work to get paid. To get things paid. like it's yeah. copywriting for social media, it's product description, it's writing, yeah. but it's not writing that has a purpose to, the only purpose is for you to get paid. So even yeah. when the money comes in, there was no real fulfillment attached to it. But this was different. This was that thing that I didn't All right. All right, uh, uh, that's that's um, an intriguing story. Finding um, where you belong, so to speak. But now I, I know that you're not in Nigeria and you haven't been for a while. But somehow you're still in the middle of these stories. You're still breaking them. You're still uncovering truths. And I, I want to ask: Does it mean that essentially, for an investigative journalist, location does not matter? Um. Not necessarily, actually. In this, in this day and age, the internet has changed a lot. If you have the right uh, sources, if you're working with the right people, and if you know your way around the internet well enough, if you're tech savvy enough, mm. and if you if you have a good enough reputation that people actually trust you with information and trust you with access, then there's a lot of work you can do without necessarily being physically present. I mean, I can tell you, for example, that the sort of most um, momentous work I think I've done in my career yeah. has been work that I did since I left Nigeria. Mm. And this, uh, this was work that was about things going on in Nigeria. But that's, that's, the, that, that's the magic of mm. the internet. You don't necessarily have to be located in a place. You just need the right reputation. You need the right know-how, technical know-how. Mm. To you know, find a way around stuff, and I'll, I'll give you just one, one short example of it. So, right. um, when I did the story, I think it was in May about the murder of the job seeker in Akwai Bom, yeah. um, I obviously I was nowhere near Akwai I was nowhere near Nigeria at the time. Yeah. But just by virtue of having access to 
uh, classified call records from telecoms company in question, uh, and then using that in conjunction with uh, cellular geolocation data, uh, and then the tool for reading cellular geolocation data to be able to um, identify where the sensitive cell towers are, and then using that in conjunction with Google Maps, I was able to put together an entire you know, investigative framework and an outcome, and I was nowhere near yeah. Nigeria. If I was in Nigeria, mm. possibly, it, you know, it wouldn't have been that much different. I would have thought, you know, probably I might have gone to, to, to acquire all my, yeah. you know, a few pictures and whatnot, but it wouldn't have been that different. And that's, that's the advantage that the yeah. internet gives us now, that it's, it has, opened, has unlocked a whole world of opportunities now, especially in a place like Nigeria, where a lot of things which used to be locked away behind an information gap, yeah. you know, prior to the internet age in Nigeria, those things have started finding their way onto the internet now. So when I did the story on um, the origin of Boko Haram, for example, people were surprised to find out that as far back as 2002, the Nigerian government has been arresting people for uh, for terrorism. People thought terrorism started in 2009 in Nigeria. Yeah. But the thing is, those uh, in 2002, when there wasn't mass internet access in Nigeria, all you had to do to restrict access to information was to make sure that your, the few major daily newspapers and the few major radio stations and TV stations that, were, that existed at the time didn't get access to that thing. Or if they did, you find a way to suppress it, mm. to stop them from publishing. That was all you had to do. Mm. But now that those documents are on the internet now and they're out of the control of the government, they're up there, just it's up to a journalist to find these things. They're publicly available now. And nobody can stop the flow of information now, which creates an interesting new set of opportunities. Mm. All right. All right. Now, um, like I said before, you've been at the center of so many groundbreaking stories. Now, do you find that there's, uh, for instance, all the stories, most of the stories you publish, it's usually accomplished with some buzz, backlash, and so on. Do you find that uh, there's pressure on you to always dazzle and surprise? And do you think that this might influence um, uh, maybe you and the kind of stories you go for. Do you think you might miss certain stories because they are not as blockbustery as as uh, people expect you to be? Because nobody wants to read a a, a simple, uh, you know, non-exciting story from David Hondain. Do you think that makes you puts you on your toes to always find something sensational? What I try to do is I try to. Uh, um, what's the word? Separate the type of work I do based on the platform it's meant for. So, I mean, it would be a lie to say that um, the type of the type of story in question doesn't influence uh, my editorial decisions. That is true. It does influence my editorial decisions. So, mm. there there are certain stories that, depending on on what I judge, what I subjectively judge to be their potential impact on 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 public discourse, mm. that I might prioritize those stories. That doesn't mean that other less, supposedly less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, less impressive or less sensational stories are less important. Yeah. But it just means that the, the platform that, that I will publish them on will be different. So, for example, you often see me uh, put up stories on my Twitter page. Mm. I'm not publishing them on my platform. I'm not publishing them on Newswire or Business Day. It's just going to my Twitter page. Mm. Some stories will go to my Medium page. So, for example, when I when I interviewed um, the the leader of the um, the Amazonian sort of um, I don't know, I, I don't want to call them separatists because they didn't mm. like being called separatists. Yeah. But the Amazonian movement in Cameroon, the leader yeah. who is currently in prison in Yaoundé, when I interviewed him earlier in the year, that interview and the associated content around uh, around it went to my media, where it also had you know a, a fairly large readership as well. So I I find that generally. Whatever I do, wherever I put it on, there is always a significant readership anyway. But what I try to do is I try to separate the different types of stories and put them on the different platforms that I think they work for. So West Africa Weekly, for example, which is like my primary flagship publication, right? Yeah. It's a publication that I own, that I run. Yeah. The the stories that I that you find in West Africa Weekly, they might be what you would you might refer to as sensational because mm. the, the topics and themes that are involved in those stories are top topics of big national interest. So, Boko Haram, um, the Tinubabala mm -hmm. story, and uh, uh, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. 
um, and SARS, um, uh, uh, intellectual property theft that involves big corporates that we know of in Nigeria, things like that. So you might find those stories in West Africa. But if someone brings a story about, oh, um, this person defrauded me and is hiding somewhere in the Czech Republic, and mm. this is the proof that he defrauded me and defrauded other people, that story. It's, it's an important story too, but I don't think it works for East Africa. So I might put that story up on my Twitter page, yeah. where it will also get a, a, a large readership, but I yeah. think it works best for that platform. So that's what I tend to do with those stories. I separate, I segment them uh, uh, according to the different platforms that I think they work for. And then uh, I also have to point out that in terms of what you would refer to as sensationalism, yeah. in itself, that isn't... A, that is not an, an editorial um, factor mm. to be considered because when we are doing stuff that is in the public interest, mm. there, are, there are lots of stories that uh, people bring to you which are quote unquote sensational, yeah. but which are not really in the public interest. So, in the past month, for example, I've had people uh, bring in story tips involving uh, very sort of salacious, sort of gossipy stuff about people in power mm. and if you if i were to publish that it will get a lot of buzz and everything yeah. but when you think about it objectively this is not really in public interest if you can prove that some guy in some ministry did mm. something one time does that really change anything does that move the conversation the national conversation forward uh, necessarily no it doesn't you just put your name up in lights which is not really the goal the goal is mm. to spark some kind of change the goal is for the story to have an impact not merely to be read. So yeah. no, sensationalism itself is not a factor. However, depending on how sensational the story could be, the story is then segmented based on the platform. Yeah. All right. All right, now, uh, I, I'd still like to know more about, you know, the challenges of, you know, uncovering truths and all that. But uh, let's head over to something else of interest. I, I'm curious about your relationship with your colleagues. Now, uh, there seems to be a timeline of events of the way whenever uh, a story of yours uh, is published, it seems to, by my own uh, reckoning, it seems to follow this process. So when it comes out, there's buzz, there's reaction, uh, people are, you know, sharing it massively. It even ends up on the fabled or the, uh, the popular Nigerian women, uh, Nigerian mothers, uh, WhatsApp group PCs and all that. And then the next thing we get is sometimes, occasionally, perhaps not all the time, the persons involved in the story might uh, react. But there's another interesting part of this. There is a part where journalists, uh, your colleagues, start to pick apart your story. And they say, this is not true journalism. He's, uh, he's, 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 he's doing this for clouds. This was not properly done. Let me quote um, one of them. He says, uh, and I quote, that you are, quote unquote, making claims without citing data to support conclusion. Now, my question to you is, do you feel alienated from your colleagues? Uh, or do you think they have a point? Or do you think they, they kind of keep you in check without, so that you don't go, you know, you don't get it uh, too much uh, into the story that you, you know, add, as they say, so, uh, spice? The, the quote you just read out, I actually know who made that quote, and I know mm -hmm. the story you made it with reference to. It was with reference to the story. Um, now, I don't know if you've read that story, uh, yeah, but I don't conflicts. think there's anybody who has read, conflicts with who yeah. has read that story. Yes, that story. I don't think there's anyone who has actually read the story and not merely listened to what people said about it, but who actually read the story, who would say that I made claims or I didn't provide uh, basis for those mm. claims. I didn't provide evidence because the entire story, like everything else that I write, was chock full of references, links, mm. screenshots, receipts, pictures, every So a, a, a sort of uh, popular journalistic convention in Nigeria when, yeah. when reporting a story is to say things like uh, so-and-so was informed on good authority that or sources claim that. I never mm. do that. I never ever do that. If there's any, if, if there's a story which uh, I don't have something that I can show to the audience as proof, I simply won't publish it. Everything is always referenced. So when this guy came out and said you're making claims based on uh, yeah, uh, claims that are not based on data, 
he was literally picking something out of the air. It was mm. completely untrue. And this is this is an issue that I have with some of my, I, I wouldn't say all of my colleagues, but I'll yeah. say some of my colleagues, possibly even many of my colleagues. Yeah. They find it that uh, I apparently came in from nowhere because maybe three years ago, nobody in Nigeria really knew who I was. I, mean, I had a pretty large portfolio, but you know, if you weren't in the industry, you wouldn't have any idea who I was, right? Yeah. So it's from like 2019 that I started deliberately and intentionally growing my public profile because I was trying to achieve something else. So people feel as if this guy was nobody in 2018. We've been around since, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to mention names here. So you know, people like your, your Nicolas Ibequiz, people like that who have been around, mm. they were the pioneers of, of, uh, of, of online journalism. journalism in Nigeria. So yeah. They've been around since 2009 or so. These mm. people feel as if, look, we were here from the start. We are the ones who, who built this ecosystem. We are the OGs here. This guy, this you know, this young Turk just yeah. came in 2019, mm. and all of a sudden, nobody can hear what he did. Mm. Every and it, uh, uh, our audiences are now measuring our work against his and using mm. him as the benchmark. When mm. we are actually the ones who are supposed to be the benchmark, we are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who built this. We are the ones who are supposed to be the reference. We are we are supposed to be the standard. Yeah. And so, as a result of that, whether they call it professional jealousy or envy or disgruntlement, whatever it is. As a result of that, their reaction to that is very interesting. There, there are some possible reactions that I, I would have had in mind, right? One possible reaction is maybe try and get in touch with me. I'm accessible. Everybody has my number. Hmm. I mean, when, when you try to get in touch with me to set up this, this interview, the first thing I send you is my number. I don't, I don't hmm. keep that information away from people. I'm very accessible. You can reach out to me if you want to have a conversation with me. If you have any problem with me, you can reach out to me and talk about it at any time. Not a single one of them has ever done that. If you if you don't want to reach out to me, then I guess the more the the more consequential thing you could do is you could just keep on doing your own work, write mm -hmm. your own stories, and make sure that your stories are simply better than mine. But 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 would you would you if, would you take that likely if if they actually reached out to you to quote unquote correct you, would you take that with uh, you know uh, not, in a friendly not, manner, not, you would be offended. Be correct, because there is no, there is no single journalist. There is no singular standard for what constitutes journalism. I always mm -hmm. like to tell people that what the New York Times does and what Easter Block Nigeria does are both forms of journalism and mm -hmm. are both valid. There is no singular journalist. Right? Everybody has their own journalism. Everybody has their own style, right? So there is no such thing as correct me. But if you have, if you have. A conversation you'd like to have if there is some advice you'd like to give me or if there's just some clarification yeah. that you want or you know you just need to get something off your chest yeah. then reach out to me not a single one of them has ever done now if you don't want to reach out to me if you are too big to reach out to me or whatnot and you feel like you are the standard and you know it's because people don't know any better that they are reading my work and you are you are the one who's supposed to be getting all of the buzz Mm. Then what you could do is you could simply go and focus on creating your own work, mm. right? Such that the buzz that you think you could get it back it could be yours again. Go and create work instead of talking about my work, mm. right? Because I don't spend my time talking about other people's work. I'm always putting out work of my own. Mm. I'm a workaholic, right? As soon mm. as this call is over, so mm. right now I'm, I'm making this call on the phone. Behind the phone is my laptop screen, the Google Docs screen behind it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to do after this call. I'm constantly working. So that's how I think I tend to, to move forward in my life and in my career. I focus on me. Yeah. I, I, I focus on what I think I have to do and what I'm trying to achieve. I'm not thinking about the premium times or anybody else. I'm focused on what I want to do specifically. And I mean, not to be boastful about this, but I think the, the career that I'm having and the recognition that I'm getting would seem to indicate that this is a strategy that is working for me. Mm. So what I don't appreciate is when you you don't reach out to me on your work, mm. you think you're better than me, and then you now go, and then you don't even just start talking behind my back. You then go on social media and start telling lies. You know, so you know very well that the Nigerian audience 
obviously can be a very lazy audience. So if there's a story that is going around, yeah. and people are just hearing thoughts. Sixty percent really. of the people who are talking about that story haven't actually read it. Yeah. You know that because that's when Nigerians they talk about stuff. Yeah, that's right? true. So then you then go on Twitter and say, "Oh, this guy is making claims." And it's, it's, it's on back, blah, blah, blah. And what you are saying is completely false. It's like saying that 2 plus 2 is 5. And you know that what you are saying is a lie. But you mm. also know that people haven't read the story. People will merely see what other people are saying about it. And they start reacting based on what other people said about it. Mm. And then you now engineer engineer a, a controversy out of nowhere. right? Because the only controversy, in my opinion, that should exist in my kind of journalism is, was this statement true or not mm. is this this document that, that was presented as evidence is this document true or not was it forged those are the only controversies that should exist not that i've presented everything i'm supposed to present and then you now say no i didn't present anything because mm. then like how, how exactly am i supposed to argue with that you know i'm but, but here's, here's, here's okay. two plus two which is clearly four and then here here you are saying two plus two is five how mm. am i supposed to argue with you when you've already decided to believe something that is clearly insane. That's the problem. And that's the issue I have with a lot of my colleagues. If you have a problem with me, reach out to me and talk it out. If you don't want to reach out to me and talk it out because you are too big, focus on your work. Do your work very well. I have some colleagues who probably fit into that second category who they don't like me very much, but they are able to focus on their own work and get their work done. And I respect them a lot for that. I'm going to, like, so I'm not going to name names here, but this guy who used to work for the cable now works for the Associated Press. He falls into that category. He's not very fond of me. But if you had to ask me, name my top five journalists in Nigeria, he will always be in that mm. top five. Because he's very good at what he does. And he doesn't spend his time backbiting or talking about it. Mm. So that's that's what I would appreciate. Focus on your work. Focus on what needs to be done. Right? Nigeria is a, is a society that needs journalism. Right? So focus on that. And stop all right. Focusing all right. All right. Now, uh, for, uh, let's just very quickly, before we move on to another of your story, still on that um, uh, jihad for conflicts, or is it conflicts for jihad story, uh, many have said that it feeds into an old conspiracy of an alleged Islamization of Nigeria. Uh, do, do you believe that uh, what you did was, you know, did you believe it, you did your best or adequately in that conclusion that the NASCO group somehow funded or funds the Boko Haram, especially as religious tensions are so high at the moment. Because uh, I think that is what uh, many people have an uh, issue with, that it might become mantra or the Bible to some people, and they take it up and you know, start seeing their neighbors as people out to get them. So let me, let me just quickly correct something mentioned something about NASCO group having funded or funding Boko Haram. And yeah. I'll just use that as, as a case in point as to why I, I insist that people should always read the stories I put out carefully and not merely listen to what people said that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Now, nowhere in the story did I say that Boko Haram, that uh, NASCO group funded Boko Haram. Yeah, Boko but, but your, the what intro said, says that said, the... What I the... said was that, was that NASCO group was implicated by the US state government and by the Nigerian government for funding the GSPC, which is, which is an, an Algerian Islamic terrorist group, which was fundamental, which was important to the creation of what later became Boko Haram. So the pipeline that created what we know today as Boko Haram mm. was at least partially funded by the NASCO group. And that is a fact. The Nigerian government itself has documents in black and white saying that this is the case. And those documents were included in the story. Mm. So there wasn't a, there was, it wasn't a claim. It wasn't an allegation. Yeah. So something, uh, as I said, in the era when this this uh, this document was, was sent to the UN, in the era when these things were published, yeah. there was no mass internet access in Nigeria. So these things were simply hidden behind a wall of no information. There was no Freedom of Information Act in Nigeria then. We simply didn't know that there was this guy called uh, uh, Yakubo Musa Katsina who was arrested under the, the, the Obasan government for setting up terror cells Kano and, and, and Kaduna and, and across the north. Yeah. It simply didn't know this. Now, the Nigerian government itself wrote a letter to the UN, and the letter was signed by uh, Nigeria's representative to the UN, Ambassador Amin Ovali, stating that this guy and uh, the now late founder of NASCO, Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, 
uh, where so this guy was arrested and then uh, Ahmed Idris Nasruddin had his assets expropriated basically by the Nigerian government. His assets were seized for funding terror, mm. right? And this simply didn't get into the news then because mm. at the time there was no mass internet access. And I guess the people who someone as powerful as Ahmed Idris Nasruddin had the capacity to suppress such news then with the amount of money and power that he would at that time, it wouldn't have been that difficult to ensure that that document didn't make it into the hands of the print media in Nigeria, which was then the most powerful uh, uh, part of the media in Nigeria, or the broadcast media, which then was pretty much just two or three TV stations anyway. Yeah. But now that in the year 2021, these, uh, these documents are all online. You can find them on the UN repository because over the past decade or so, made this push to, to digitize a lot of these documents that have been in print for decades and nobody has ever seen them before. And now for the first time, you can have free access to them by simply going to the UN website, Refworld, and checking through the repository, which was where I found this document. And now it's causing embarrassment mm. because people feel like some of these crimes and sins that they thought had been covered over a long time ago, this guy has come from nowhere to start exposing things that are not meant to be exposed. I start saying things that are that are, that are not meant to be said, because there's this very uh, very uh, acute conspiracy of silence amongst mm. several uh, important people in commercial. Uh, and uh, I'm really sorry to cut you short. I'm sorry to sorry to cut you short there. Um, we're we're almost running out of time, uh, and there's something I really want to find out. Uh, you know, when I actually. Uh, announced or told people that I was having you on the program, there was a common thing that a lot of people said, which is that, um, is he coming physically? And I said, no. And then people kept saying, uh, that guy cannot come. If the moment he comes into Nigeria, his life is at risk. And I want to know, in the course of doing your job, obviously you've, you've stepped on a lot of tools, important tools, powerful tools. Now, at, behind the scenes, can you let us know, have you had threats to your life? Have people, you know, made certain uh, uh, threats to you? And um, uh, have there been attempts on your life as a result of, you know, being so bold with your stories? What happens behind the scenes that nobody knows about? So, um, the, I, I try not to um, pay too much, uh, spend too much time thinking about threats or danger because there, there's something that is a saying that my dad used to say when I was young, which has always stuck in my head, which is that he who uh, looks at the wind will never mm -hmm. sow seed. Yeah, so if you're constantly looking at the fundamentals of the situation, that how you could get hurt or how this could go wrong, then you're never going to do anything because you're just going to live your life in fear. I tend not to do that. Yes, there have been several um, credible threats to my safety. Going back as far back as 2019, actually, uh, I think this was August or so. This was, I think, the very first month when I started doing what you would call investigative journalism. When just by virtue of the analysis and columns I was doing, people had already started getting angry with me. So I traveled home to Badagri for the Salah celebration in 2019. Yeah. And I have, an, I have an uncle who is, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's a pretty high ranking, used to be a pretty high ranking person in the government, and he's also a, a, a member of the and he pulled me aside and said, uh, he said it with a smile on his face, but you could see the, there was a there was intent behind it. And he said, uh, you've been writing things, that we, that we see that you've been writing that. Have you been to the SSS headquarters in Abuja that goes seven stories on the ground that you, with these your glasses, touch the glasses on my face, that you won't see anything inside there. And then he walked away. That was the first time I ever got something you would call a threat. Between then and when I left the country, there were several. And not just from the government. So I remember in January 2020, I did a story about uh, UBA, yeah. which they, to put it lightly, did not take kindly to at all. Yeah. And I basically had to flee the country briefly. I actually you know, bought a ticket and got on a flight to Dubai. I stayed there for a few weeks because I was getting calls from people telling me that they are looking for you. There isn't police to look for you right now. Yeah. And they want to lock you up for a few weeks and teach you a lesson. Yeah. For, for, for messing with their branding, because apparently they take it very seriously when, when anyone, whether a journalist or a blogger or whoever, writes about their branding. When I came back to Nigeria at the end of January 2020, between then and November, when I left again permanently, I didn't have a fixed address. I was living out of Airbnbs constantly. I stopped driving because I was warned that uh, your car can be sabotaged, the brake lines can be cut, and you die in an accident. So 
I was always using Ubers on there and assumed name. There are lots of precautions that I constantly have to take. Now, even after leaving Nigeria, people are constantly, like, you can constantly see the efforts to try and maybe find out where you are so that maybe people can, can come and try you know, have an agenda of life. All right. or I, I, I'm so sorry. We, we've, we've, run out, we've run out of time. I, I hope we can continue this conversation some other time. Uh, there's not, not, no time left again. Uh, thanks very much for coming on Top Talk. Uh, it was really fun having you here and interesting.